Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful, beautiful day we have. What a beautiful world we live in. That we are redeemed and heaven-bound and filled with resurrection power and, and given life and joy and hope. We've got good news to share with the world. Who wouldn't want to be in this room? You know? Amen. Well, I'm excited this morning. We are continuing in uh, our letter from Peter, 1 Peter. Um, we're in chapter 2, beginning at chapter 2 this morning. So you can turn there, and uh, we're going to kind of get a, I'd like to call it a running start, but I'm actually going to backpedal as soon as we start. <laughs> So you're not confused. On your mark, get set. Therefore, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, well, what's therefore what? <laughs> Based on what just came before, therefore. So let's back up to verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Since you have, past tense, purified your soul in obeying the truth. This is how we purify our souls. We walk according to the Word of God, according to the will of God, and He is faithful, He is just, to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the resurrection power of the Spirit, it's God who does all of this, in sincere love of the brethren. One of the things I love about Sunday morning is getting together with you all. You know, and it's interesting because I get out and about in the community and I'm on the internet like other people talking to different churches and different pastors. And one of the things that just rings true as we come together in this fellowship, people are always like, the reason I came back a second time was you guys actually like each other. <laughs> you hang out after church and you socialize. You go to lunch after church. You do life together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You really are a family and that really intrigued me. Can't be said by every place you go on Sunday morning. Praise God. He's in the house. The love of Jesus flows here. Amen. Loving one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of the corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because, and we get a quote out of Isaiah chapter 40, all flesh is as grass. You and I are flesh, okay? So you get the picture here. You and me, we're like grass, okay? All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower fails away or falls away, but the word... The word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word, that word that endures forever, the word of the Lord. This is the word by the gospel which was preached to you. The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that though you were sinners, God so loved you, he sent his son. And Christ died for you that your debt may be paid. He took your sin to the cross, took it to the grave, buried it, never to be resurrected, as far as east is from the rest. But he did indeed come out of the grave in proof that all who put their faith in him will have eternal life. This is the hope that we have. This is why we hold on in patient expectation. In spite of what the world wants to tell us, we're listening to heaven. And heaven says, you're mine. I love you. I'm working for you. I'm working in you. I'm working through you. I brought you into this marvelous life that you might be my vessels. That I can share this grace with everybody. Hallelujah. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you therefore what are we going to do with this born again cleansed by the blood 
empowered by the Holy Spirit. What are we going to do? Therefore, it says, laying us offside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If indeed, in fact, have you experienced? Have you tasted? This is kind of a, a paraphrase or a quote out of Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see the Lord. He is good. And this is one of the things that we as Christians get to share with the rest of the world. When everybody says, how are you doing today? You can say, man, I'm doing great. I'm good. It's good. I've tasted. I've experienced it. I have first-hand knowledge that Jesus Christ is all that they say he is and more. And I desire it. I hunger for it. Like a newborn babe, it says here. Right? Newborn babes are innocent. They have no shame. They're guilt-free. Right? And they just, they just have this craving, if you will, that desire, the craving, a uh, constant hunger. Right? That's what babies do. Right? It's kind of what new Christians do. Right? You give them a bottle. You burp them. You change their diaper. They take a nap. Repeat. <laughs> and we just do that, don't we? How long do we do it? <laughs> a long time, right? As long as necessary, right? It's interesting in the scriptures here as we look at this idea of the word, the word of God, the gospel, the good news that was preached to you. It endures forever. It never fades. It never fails. You and I will fail. Man is like grass, but God is eternal. His word is solid. It's a foundation which you can rest your life on, bank on it, the good news is God loves you, and he's got you in his grip, and he's never going to let you go. Amen. Amen? Amen? Therefore, right, we've got all this going on. It says, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Okay, well, now remember, Peter is writing to a group of people who have been scattered, the dispersion, he calls them, in the area, the region of what we know as Turkey today. And uh, so these are Christians, and they've gone out into the world like seed, being scattered, and now they're interacting with the world around them. I'm told a little bit in the in intro with Peter and the times that he's living in, right? The Roman Empire is ruling, the Greek culture is basically undergirding everything. There's a lot of paganism, a lot of heathen stuff going on, a lot of malice, wickedness, envy, all of these things, but he says, you... Don't be that way. Remember, we opened up. You are elect. You've been chosen. You've been selected. You have been taken into the kingdom of God. God chose you. You didn't choose you. God did it, and through his power, he's doing all the work. All you have to do is receive it in faith. Say thank you. Believe it. Trust him and walk in it, right? And, and then you will live in hope, right? And we, we broke it down last week in uh, chapters 3, uh, or verses 3 through 12, living in hope. Right? Holding on with patient expectation. I'm so excited. Right? In holiness, in verse 13 through 21, we are set apart. We are separate. We are to be not like the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. We are out there as trophies for God. Okay? And, and he wants us to be in the world where people can see us, but we need to be separated from it. And not part of that. And then finally, in a harmony with one another, with God and with one another, in verses 20 through 25, what we just finish off, as we walk out, we live out our election, we, we live out our adoption, we live out our new status as children of God in hope, in holiness, and in harmony with God and one another. And in this, by your love, one to another, the world will know that you are disciples of Jesus Christ. You are followers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're heaven bound. And if they want to get on that train, they just need to tuck in behind you. Right? This is what Peter's trying to let these people know that have been scattered out to the world and are facing persecution. In 1 Peter, there's going to be persecution that comes from outside against the church. Some of the things that are going on today. You know, Jeff was letting me know, I, we follow uh, a pastor out of Kenanohe, uh, Oahu, 
J B Farag, okay, J B F A R R A G, and I, I I put that out to you because I highly recommend you look him up. You just put his name in, and he'll come up, and he's a pastor of the Calvary Chapel there. But in addition to his weekly sermons, he does a weekly prophecy update. His prophecy update this past week was taken down from YouTube. Okay, it's part of what's happening in the world today. Christian voices, conservative voices are being censored. They're, they're, they're trying to throttle us down, right? Peter had the same issues. Okay, so this is not new. It might be new to us. I think I heard Sherry got one of her things dinged because she passed on something that they didn't think worthy. And so in our own church, people are being censored. We need to understand people, and again, I don't want to get off on too much of a rant right here, because that's not really what I meant to say, but, but please understand this. Church is not optional for Christians, and you can't just go to your internet or your TV and sit around in your pajamas and drink your cappuccino and praise the Lord and think you did church. Okay? I'm not saying that there's no value in those tools. Wonderful tools. I use them. I'm constantly listening to sermons and following uh, other ministries and trying to make sure I, you know, drive between the lines. I don't want to get us out into some place in the weeds of the market. I, you know, I'm trying to make sure we're, we're, what's going on in the world and all of that. But I saw something that was funny. Some of you might know of this, uh, this I guess it's a, I don't know what it is, but it's called Babylon B. Some of you know what it is, some of you don't. Those of you that don't, ask the person who goes, oh yeah. But there was a cute one. This last week, and it had to do with uh, Zoom church. It's exploded. People are going to Zoom church. And it's satirical. Okay, Babylon B is a satirical thing. Everything they, they write is tongue-in-cheek. But they said, we have now evidence that people who do faithfully attend Zoom church will, in fact, go to Zoom heaven. There's something missing when you don't gather with the body of Christ, okay? And Peter's going to get into that in just a minute, so I don't want to steal that thunder. But we need to be, as lights in this world, laying aside all malice. That's the word in Greek, kakia. Okay? Um, sounds like what the baby does in the diaper. <laughs> and we need to stop doing that, okay? Maybe as Christians, we need to get potty trained. You might think that one through for a minute in light of your social media, in light of the things that you're seeing, in light of the conversations you're having amongst your family and friends and workmates, and you go, you know, are we just filling up diapers every day? We need to lay aside all kakia, all malice, okay? This, this really is evil and it's wicked. It's empty, it's vain, it's of no use to the kingdom of heaven. Malice Deceit, guile, being sly, scheming, being cunning. We need to just be transparent. Our yes is yes, our no is no. We're an open book, the world can see us, and they don't have to wonder where we're going or when the shoe's gonna fall, you know? And, 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 and this, is, this is what Peter's saying, our witness in the world, based on you've been redeemed by the word of God, the pure word that endures forever, stand up, speak up. Look up! Your redemption draws nigh. Let's, let's be people of the word, lying aside all deceit, hypocrisy, being two-faced, saying one thing to one person, another thing to the other person. Envy and all evil speaking. And that evil speaking really has mostly to do with gossip. Just passing on spicy little tidbits. Things that are of no value and even destructive others. Peter says you need to put this stuff away. And, and it's interesting that Peter would be the one to say this. I'm going to take you to Galatians for just a second. Galatians chapter 1 at verse 6. Remember, this is therefore based on the word of God that endures forever that was preached to you, the gospel. Based on the gospel, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, one of the earliest letters um, to the Christians, 
In verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, the pure word of the milk. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, condemned. Literally, it's damned. Your life is forfeit. Your destiny is not heaven. Let him be accursed. If they're out there preaching a different, another, a false gospel, a false good news, as if it's good news, it's fake news. Okay. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So Paul doubles up on that. Now, I, I said it's interesting that we're in Peter. Here's what happens in the book of Galatians. Peter had been visiting Antioch. Paul was in Antioch. Peter, one of the pillars of the church really was maybe an apostle to the, the Jews. Well, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, right? Peter was really reaching out amongst the Jews. But Paul had a problem with Peter. And it's recorded in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Wow. Paul's talking smack about Peter. For before certain men came from James, another pillar of the faith, another leader in the church, these men that came up to visit Antioch, before they got there, and Peter was there with Paul, before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. No problem. Hanging out. But when they came, these people from James, these Judaizers is the term in the uh, New Testament, when they, came with, uh, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. The circumcision is just a ritual act by which you must endure. You need, you need to do this thing to be accepted amongst the community of Jews and hope to go to heaven. It was a ritual of works, something that you have to do. The reality is you don't have to do anything. God has done it all. All to him I owe. Jesus paid my debt, that crimson stain. He washed it white as snow, okay? And Peter here was caving to the people that says, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Legalism works. Trying to attain your righteousness, your right standing with God through things that you can do. And the reality is, we're all, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We can't really do anything. What we can do is realize that God did everything. And when you stop and say, thank you, Jesus, for doing all that stuff I couldn't do, Jesus smiles and says, man, that's exactly why I did it. And you become a child of God, right? But Peter, he backslid. He backslid when he was under this pressure to perform in front of the, the legalists, the religionists. The people that say you've got to do it this way or that way. And somehow earn points with God, okay? Paul would go on in Galatians at verse, or chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? You knew. We told you straight up. This is the gospel. Just as uh, we read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus Christ, Son of God, lived a sinless life, was buried, according to the Scriptures, and rose three days again later, according to the Scriptures. It was clearly portrayed to you that this is how you enter heaven, by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed, among you is crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? The answer is no. Or by the hearing of faith? The answer is yes. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? 
who suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain. It goes on into chapter 5, verse 1 of Galatians. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I think I heard that somewhere this morning. Dallas just said that this morning in our announcements. Stand free. Stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. And finally, Galatians 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Peter, he had a boo-boo, an error. He slipped up. He caved in front of peer pressure. The big wigs from Jerusalem come to town, and all of a sudden he's not going to hang out with those Gentiles, those non-circumcised people, the people that don't do all the religious rituals. So what does Peter write to us in 1 Peter? Therefore, laying aside all the malice, all the deceit, all the hypocrisy. Being one thing to one person and one thing to another. Envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes. This is what the scripture often calls new Christians. Babes. And it's not because we look down on new Christians as if they're anything less than super ancient Christians. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are completely, totally, 100% set free, clean, redeemed, heaven-bound, child of God, signed, sealed, and delivered. But you got stuff you got to learn. you got a road you got to walk. And you start out, and so the picture is really just the, the progression of, of a person from, you know, infancy through life into maturity. And so we refer to people who have just started on their journey with Jesus as, as babes, okay? It's not derogatory. It's just recognition that you're in the beginning steps. You're, you're crawling. You're toddling. You're bottle, burp, diaper, nap for a while. And as you grow, how do you grow? Through the pure word, the pure milk of the word, right? Just like babies need nourishment, our spirit, our, our, our newly born spirit needs nourishment. And nourishment is the Word of God. It's interesting in the scriptures, different terms for the word milk right here, which you will get to babes. Uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, it talks about solid food. In other places, it refers to the Word of God. Dining on the Word of God, eating, if you will, the Word of God, absorbing, digesting the Word of God into your spirit, into your soul. Meat, it's called, the solid Word. Uh, Jesus himself calls himself the bread of life, right? This is what we do in communion. We break and we consume the bread of life, right? We grow, we get stronger. Our walk gets uh, more mature. Uh, in the Psalms, it's called uh, the honeycomb. The Word of God is as sweet as a honeycomb. And it just becomes something so precious. But we begin with this craving, this desire. I, I need to feed on the Word of God. And Christian, whatever stage of life you are in, whether you're an infant, toddler, adolescent, mature, ancient, <laughs> Where you want to say, it never stops. We have to eat and we have to feed ourselves. How often do you eat? Just survey. How often do you eat? <laughs> Daily. Right? Fundamentally. Are you feeding yourself daily? It doesn't matter what stage of life. You're always going to need to be fed. This is the importance of the Word of God. It endures forever. Therefore... Get off the... Nah, that's Mike's rant. It's probably not fair. I'll say it and you can crucify me for it later. Get off the social media. Get off the, the squawk, the, the, the junk, the, the junk food, you know, the malice, right? All the cockia, all the junk that comes our way. Evil speaking, gossip. What does it matter to you that such and such a celebrity is getting a divorce from such and such a celebrity? Really? 
How does that in any way benefit you or anybody else? Now, shame on me. I shouldn't be your judge. I do stupid things too. I read dumb things and then I'm like, oh, man, I, I got to get clean. So what do you do? You get washed with the water of the Word. You go back to the Word of God. You cleanse your mind. You cleanse your spirit. You cleanse your soul. Spend time in the Word of God. And this is what Paul really wants us to understand as we have been chosen by God, elect, empowered. We have an inheritance on reserve for us. Our name's waiting when we get there to heaven to claim it. So we're living in that patient endurance, holding on with great expectation. We're setting ourselves aside in holiness unto the Lord, washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, clean and pure. And we're living in harmony with God and with one another, and we're getting rid of the junk. And we're growing up, and we're feeding, learning to feed ourselves, right? Of course, you usually start off going to church and the, the pastor preaches a sermon and you get fed. Or you go online and you listen to somebody who's preaching a sermon and you get fed. Or you go to a Bible study or you have friends who are helping you to understand this bit of scripture or that passage in the Bible. And you're feeding and you grow and you get stronger. This is what Paul wants us to know. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Okay? He's speaking to Christians, elect of the dispersion. Okay? That's, that's the crowd that he's talking to them. Now he's going to change his metaphor from newborn babes to living stones. Okay? In verse 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, and this is a quote out of Isaiah 28, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So Peter now is, is taking something from the Old Testament. Remember what the prophets had said. You know, we, we, we started up, we opened with Isaiah chapter 40. All flesh is as grass, right? But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now we've got a prophecy from Isaiah out of Isaiah 28. We talked about this last week in verse uh, 10 of chapter 1. Of this salvation that we have. This election. This this. This choice of God for us, of this salvation of prophets is required, and search carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. <laughs> they were talking about you here in the Bible. They're talking about you there in Isaiah. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. Hey. There you are, in the Bible. You and us. We is us. We're here. You see, do you see yourself in the Bible? You're, it is exactly what this is saying. But to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, though those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which even angels desire to look into. Whew. So we've got these great prophecies, and Peter falls back on another prophecy. This one out of the uh, the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And Peter is encouraging you and me, come to him, come to God, come to Jesus Christ as to a living stone, indeed, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And Peter might know a thing or two about this living stone business. You might remember back in, well, in the Gospels, in Matthew, in chapter 16, the disciples are on a field trip, and they're up in the northern reaches of Israel to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus is teaching them about who he is and who his followers are, and what his plans for them will be. 
And it's a wonderful place for us this morning to figure out who he is, who we are, and what his plans are for us. And so I'll take you to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to pick up at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, so his disciples are replying, Some say John the Baptist. Some people were thinking you're John the Baptist. Some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And that's a question that's on the table for every soul that walks the face of the earth. That includes each of us in this room this morning. Who do I, Mike, say that he is? Who do you, Teddy, say that he is? Who do we? That's what Jesus really wants to know. I don't care what the rest of the world says. Right now I'm asking you this question. Springs, this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is. Simon Peter, okay, he has a little experience with this, answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Woohoo! It says, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You got a good answer, Peter. That is the answer. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the one that has been spoken of from Genesis throughout the scriptures, the one that is to save man from his sins. Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the child, the son, whose government will be on his shoulders, the one who has been prophesied throughout all of eternity to come and redeem the world. That's who you are. You're the Christ, the son of the living God, now, they were standing at a place in Caesarea Philippi at the headwaters of the Jordan River where there's a huge cliff. It, I can see it in my mind. It's probably, it's, a, it's, a, it's about a half again as tall as this building, maybe twice as tall as the building, and at least four or five times as wide. Big cliff. And then out of the bottom of the cliff in the back is this huge grotto, a cave that just goes down in, and out of that cave flows a river. The, the headwaters of the Jordan River. Jor means Adam, and Dad means uh, judgment. The, the rivers of the Jordan River flow right out of this rock. And Jesus is standing there with his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And this place, at the time that Jesus was speaking, was filled with all kinds of pagan temples. And, and, and they would worship this. They even said that hole where the river comes out, that was the doorway, the entrance, the gate to Hades, okay, the underworld, and, and all these things. And as Jesus is there, it's a teachable moment. Okay, they say you're Pan, they say you're Zeus, they say you're John the Baptist, they say you're Elijah, they say you're Jeremiah. Who do you say? You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Well done, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't really riddle it out with your thinking cap. You didn't Google it, okay? This is an inside job. God just spoke to you. He revealed who I am to you. Well done, okay, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you. Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter. He was Cephas. Okay? But Peter, in the Greek, is Petros. And Cephas became Petros. Jesus gave him the nickname. Rock or stone. As they stand at this magnificent stone face with all these people worshiping all these religions, Peter makes the great confession, the foundation of our faith, the rock upon which we all this morning stand. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is not shaken. It's immutable. It's eternal. You are God. He says to you on this rock, this confession of faith, I will build my church. 
ekklesia. It's a Greek word. It's the two words in it. Ek and kaleo. Kaleo is the word to call. Hey! Dallas! Come on up! If I said that, how many of you guys would come here? One. There's one Dallas, and I called him. Hey, Rick! Come on up. Called an ek, out of. That's what the word church means. When Jesus says, I will build my called out ones. It was a term that was used in society in the days of Jesus for the assembly of the citizens. In the Greek culture, people would assemble to the town square to take care of business, maybe voting in elections. They were the culture that introduced democracy. Everybody gets to say something. Everybody gets to vote. And they would come together in the ecclesia, the gathering together. We read this word. It's actually it's a synonym to the Hebrew word synagogue, where they would gather together in a building to worship, to have fellowship, to read the scrolls, to study the doctrines, to break bread, to feast, and to join life together. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my body. I'm going to build my followers based on this confession that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is what we do right now. This is why we are here in this building. We all stand. And I'm going to encourage you, stand up. It's going to be, it's going to take a second. We stand up. We speak up. We look up. And we say, and you can repeat after me, I believe, I believe you are the Christ, you are the, Christ the, Son of the, living God. the Son of the Living God. Good job, Ecclesia. Good job, Church. We have come together out of society to this place at this time corporately with one another and we have declared Jesus Christ is God. This is what the Church does. This is what Jesus said He would do. On this confession, I will build my Church. We are his church. Amen? Amen. You can say that. I say that because church is being attacked. The, we're in a world where gathering together is frowned upon. But by the grace of our governor, he put a little clause in the stage two reopening that says church is exempt. And we can do what we just did. We can gather together and declare Jesus Christ is Lord. We read it. Yeah, amen. And the reason I'm making such a big point of that this morning is because I might not be able to next week. I don't know what's happening with our culture, <laughs> with our, our, our nation, with our laws. But I do know what Jesus says. When you see these things begin to happen, look up. Stand up. Speak up. Pray. Your redemption's just knocking on the door. We need to be people of hope, of light, salt. We need to be getting out into the world and, and letting people see that there is an exit, there's a door. There's a way through this path. It's going to be narrow. It's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy, but there's a way out. And when you see everybody, all the lemmings, going down that broad way, the least of destruction, don't go there. Gather together as a church. And if they shut us down on YouTube, on our podcasts, you know where you can hear this? In this room. This is what the church is and has been from the day that Jesus made the declaration. We are the true news, we are the good news, and we gather to declare Jesus to the world. Bring a friend, let him know. That's what we do, and that's why I, I, I just I'm so grateful for the days we live in. I'm not sure if I'll, I'll probably stop right here. <laughs> I don't want to overemphasize the point, but 
you know, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, it's easy just to go along and expect that next Sunday will be next Sunday, and the one after that, and the one after that. And I just want to make sure that you've heard it here in this room. In case, no, your internet stops working. God is still on the throne. His word endures forever. You are a child of God. You are elect. You've been selected. You're heaven bound. And you have a mission. And we, we need to be about our Father's business. So, coming to Him as a living stone, right? Upon this rock, I will build my church. You're alive. You've been born again. Okay? We just read that uh, last week. As a living stone, rejected and beat by men, but chosen by God and precious. Man, I just love that precious. <laughs> what can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? What can cleanse me from within? Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. How precious. What a great value, what we have received. There's nothing like it in the world. It's totally worth celebrating over and over and over again. Jesus is so precious, and you also as living stones, in like manner, in resurrection power, in election by God, in predestination, for works that he's laid out for you to do from before the foundation of the world are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's why you've been called. You've been saved to serve. Okay? You've been saved for a purpose. God has a plan for you. And he's going to take whatever you brought to him just like Peter the fisherman, Jeter, Peter the, I don't know, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, right? Peter the passionate, Peter the impulsive, and God made him Peter the patient. Peter the apostle of hope, hanging on, right? And God's got work for us to do. I love it. We are being built up into a spiritual house. We read in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, again in chapter 6, how do you not know that you are the temple of the living God? The temple, the place where God goes to meet with people. And like the Jews, they had a temple in Jerusalem, and they would go there for their rituals, right? For their sacrifices, to try to be made right with God, and all the different things that would go on there. But it was really a place for rituals to take place. But the Jews didn't go there every Saturday for religious services. For that, they went to the synagogue. They went to the assembly. What we read in the New Testament, the church, the ecclesia. They went to church, okay? Local gatherings. And they continued, as we read in the book of Pentecost, or in the book of, in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, pardon me, in Acts chapter 2, as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter preached an amazing sermon. People ask, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent, be baptized. And 3,000 people were added to the church that day, called out of darkness and into his marvelous life, and they continued then doing that steadfastly. The apostles' doctrine, studying the word of God. Fellowship. Koinonia, having all things in common. We're going to go and have cinnamon rolls in common in a couple minutes here. <laughs> Doing life together. Fellowship, the breaking of bread, communion, becoming one with Christ, recognizing where our nourishment comes from. And prayer. And we continue doing these things. Just Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assemblings, the episynagogue. That's that word. It's the proof text. Why we need to come together physically as a body. Not forsaking the episynagogue. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the habit of some. 
especially as you see the day approaching. Church, this is essential. What we're doing is probably one of the most essential things for our well-being as babes, as toddlers, as adolescents, as whatever stage of life you might be, it's one of the most critical things we can do in this lifetime is gather as a body. Encourage one another, build each other up, provoke one another to good works. That we come together and we share God's stories and Jesus hugs and gosh, what happened? Man, I got a pair of pants this week. Really? Wow, I'm so excited for you. No, we, there's more to this story. There's more to this story. This is a Jesus story. And we get encouraged. We get built up. We get filled up. We look up. We stand up and we speak up. And that's what we do. And that's why we continue to do this. We're being built up in a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We don't go to some building down on some street with some funky angel up on the top where we do our rituals. And, and, I, and I say that because we read in Galatians, what did Paul have to say? <laughs> I am so beside myself. How have you so quickly turned away from the gospel? But we're the church. This is where we do our spiritual acts of worship and our sacrifices. This is how we do it. It's simple. These other places, the temple, Gentiles couldn't get in. You and I would not be able to go and perform their rituals to be good enough to go to heaven. We weren't even allowed. You cross the line, they kill you. Today, temples in our community, you can't get in. Not without a pass. Somebody's got to sign off. You've done enough work to go there. But we are a temple. This is it. This is what it looks like. We're stones. It's, I love it that we're in this building, you know. The Springs Calvary Chapel, Old Haven Elementary School. It's a brick building. And one brick fitted to a brick, to a brick, to a brick. It's a, it's a picture of a spiritual reality of what's going on in here, in our lives. Down in the Sunday school room. In Pure Word on Friday nights. In the Senior Study on Tuesday. In Koinonia this Monday. In all the different... Places where we fit ourselves together and are being built up into a spiritual house. That's what Peter's saying. We're those living stones being built up to offer up spiritual sacrifice. Therefore, it's also contained in the scripture, and a quote out of Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. This is a quote, this is a passage in the scripture uh, where we, we understand that there's this chief cornerstone. Maybe you don't know in architecture or building uh, engineering how this works, but when you build a building out of stone, that cornerstone is critical. It must be set perfect and be solid and secure because everything ties into it. The whole building relies on that perfect cornerstone being set. And what the scriptures are teaching us is Messiah, what the prophets looked into, longed for, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is that stone. He's that foundation upon which his church is built. He's the confession. And everything else ties into that chief cornerstone and we're built up into a strong, secure house for sharing worship, free for all to come in. Therefore, you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now this jumps over to Psalm 118. And Jesus Christ quoted this when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the week before he was crucified, that last week of his life, as he came down the Mount of Olives from Bethany down into the Kidron Valley, he stopped and he wept. And he quoted out of this psalm, um, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. I'm going to take you to Psalm 118 really quick. And I just want to look at a little bit of this. It's, it's wonderful. And you have to understand, when it's on the lips of Jesus, and he's talking about the day that he rode in to claim his crown, 
His kingdom. This is what we read. In verse 15 of Psalm 118, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And as the people were singing Psalm 118, as the disciples and Jesus wound down that Palm Sunday road and sang this song, the religious leaders along the side are saying, Shh, Rabbi, tell those people to be quiet. They're singing about Messiah. They're singing about the Deliverer. They're singing about the Christ. And they're applying it to you. Tell them to be quiet. Remember what Jesus said? Even if these should keep silent, the stones would cry out. Right? And uh, so they, they, they keep go on in verse uh, 25 of Psalm 118. Say it now, literally, Hosanna! Say it now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Boy, those people were so happy to see Jesus come into town. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Woohoo! Then I wonder how they reconciled this verse as they sang this line. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. They're praising Christ, and now they're talking about sacrificing Him. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. And Jesus Christ is saying, I am that rock. I am that rock that is spoken up by Isaiah. I am that rock which is spoken up by the psalmist. I am that rock. I am the chief cornerstone. In Isaiah 28, he says, I'm that stumbling stone. Those who believe in me, man, it's great. You're going to be part of this, this living testimony to me in the world. But the rest of you, I'm a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. I will fall on you, I will crush you, I will pulverize you like powder. Not that, not that Christ wants that, but you have a choice. Right? You can be a saint, you can be set apart to God, or you're going to go up against this rock and it's going to crush you. You can't stand it. He's a supernatural stone in Daniel, in chapter 2, and again, in uh, the back of the book of Daniel, that comes out from heaven and destroys all the kingdoms of the world. He's that rock, that spring of water that followed the Israelites through the wilderness. We read in 1 Corinthians 10. Jesus Christ is the rock. He's our solid foundation. He's a living stone. He's the chief cornerstone. And as we hook into him, and we are set in place, each one of us, each one of us important. You're important. If you walk out this building today and you look up on the side of the building and you see a brick missing, you start understanding why it's important that we each participate. We not only receive strength from one another, we not only are built on a solid foundation that cannot be shaken, but we give our strength to others. It's important that we share what we have received, that we are linked together. And this is what Peter is trying to help us to understand. It talks about those who reject and don't consider Jesus precious. Verse 8, I'll say, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word, which they were also appointed. And there's some that are not going to receive Christ. But you, verse 9, and worship team, you can come on up. Well, I guess that's Nathan. Jasmine, come on up. But you, okay, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now 
the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. We are children of God. We're chosen. We're elect. We're predestined. We're a chosen generation. It's interesting, right? We talked about Peter saying that we're part of this living house, this place of worship. But it's not like the Jews built an annex off to the side of the temple, and that's where the you know, Gentiles go into the, the annex. We all go in through the same door. That door is Jesus Christ. And all who worship Him must enter in the same way. There's not one or the other, but God has done something very special in that He built this witness to the world, first through the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then through the temple, that people could come and see and know who He is, and now he's created us, living stones scattered throughout the world, this living temple where people are able to come. But we're not just an annex. This is the central place where we all go. It's for the pilgrims, the sojourners, those people in the world to bring light to the world. We're called out of the world, and uh, we're more like the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? God has filled us with His Holy Spirit. Wherever we go, where two or three are gathered in His name, there He is in the midst of us. And as the tabernacle moved through the wilderness, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, moved, and people could come and meet God. Wherever the church was, wherever the people were, wherever the body, the ecclesia was. You are that chosen generation. That word for generation is genos. And I say that because it literally translates into kind, like in Genesis chapter 1, each after their own kind, it's generated as race. Literally. You are a new race of people. You're different. You're not whatever race you think you used to be. And if you're trying to figure out your race by how much melanin you have in your skin, what kind of pigment you might have, I would say check your heart. Check your spirit. Is Christ precious to you? Because if Christ is precious to you, you're a new race. You're a completely different animal. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what continent you were born on. It doesn't matter what family you came from. You are now of the race of the children of God. You're king's kids. A complete new generation. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. You're king's kids. Kids of the king. And we're priests. We no longer need to go to a temple. We each go straight to God. A uh, royal priest said, a holy nation, set apart, different from the world that we live in. His own special people, chosen, royal, holy, special. <laughs> it's awesome that you may proclaim, this is why, <laughs> this is why he did all this for you, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous life. Can we do that in just a minute? Marvelous. Who once were not a people, but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It's interesting, you know, as we stand here, or I stand here, and you are listening, and here we are gathered in the Springs, Calvary Chapel. How many of you might have even known anything about Calvary Chapels or the Calvary Chapel movement? We have a magazine. It comes out once in a while. There's some out there. You can pick one up. It just came out this week. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Avi's in it. You can see her picture in there. Uh, a number of people. that, and, and you can learn about this. But the Calvary Chapel movement. It's, it was birthed as a work of God. You take a couple middle-aged, balding guy, straight legs, and send them out to a church on the beaches of California. And a bunch of long-haired, pot-smoking hippies walked through the door. And revival broke out. They became part of what was known as the Jesus People Movement. It swept the nation. What was it? This wonderful vision of this middle-aged balding guy? The hippies? Stoned out of the mind? Whoa, Jesus. What was it? 
It was the Word of God. It was the Word of God. That endures forever. And when people say, well, you're not relevant to this generation. They don't want to hear about the Bible. They don't want to hear about the Word of God. They don't want to hear about holiness and righteousness and sin and judgment. The Word of God endures forever. And God is creating a people for himself, a completely new race. Not hippies, not middle-aged old people, a new race, Christian. And that's who we are. And that's what we pray God will allow us to continue to be. How long, I don't know. I don't need to see much longer. But in the meantime, we need to be about our Father's business. Next week, we're going to be talking about the holy nation that we are to be. In submission to, and get ready for this, you might want to skip next week. In submission to the authorities and to our masters and to our spouses. I don't know which one of those loves you worse. But we have an opportunity in the world today. We have an opportunity when we get up and we go out of this room. You go to lunch. You go to work. Wherever you go, we have work to do. We are to be about our Father's business. We're supposed to let our light so shine that the world might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And I know it's easy to gripe and moan and get on your cocky devices. Just remember that pure word, consume it, be nourished, be built up. Amen? Amen. Let's well, praise God, right? We'll go ahead and pray. And I understand there's some cinnamon rolls ready, waiting for you all that have been patient. <laughs> Thank you again, Nathan and Madison, for visiting us. We're praying for you and hopes for your youth group out in Kimberly. Thank you, Jasmine. We're praying for you. And, and Jonathan, if you can hear us in there. Or if you say, hey, Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous sight. We are called out. We are your church. We confess you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we rejoice to do it every chance we get. On Sunday, on Wednesday, as we gather with our family, as we go to work, as we listen on the radio, in our cars, or whatever we do, Lord, help us to be people that declare the praises of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen?